So um, for those of you who perhaps haven't um, been with us in the past few weeks, um, we've been looking at uh, this book, which uh, is fairly hot off the press, from um, someone called John Philip Newell, who has a rich tradition in the Celtic uh, tradition. And um, each, we've been taking each chapter week by week. So in previous weeks, we've been looking at things like... Um, and, and these are all the things that he thinks uh, the, the Christian faith uh, needs to look at afresh and reconnect with. So what, one of them is reconnecting with the earth, reconnecting with compassion, uh, with uh, the light that is at the heart of everything, with journey, with other traditions, uh, with non-violence, uh, re reconnecting with the unconscious, with myth and the power of story. And the one I'm looking at today is reconnecting with spiritual practice. And then next week, John is going to wrap up the series with uh, looking at the last chapter, which is reconnecting with love. So it's, uh, it's quite an easy read. So um, if you are interested, then uh, do have a look. So, when um, John Philip, <laughs> hi, when John Philip Newell was writing this uh, book, he each, for each chapter he had in his mind a location on the island of Iona. For a number of years, he was the warden of the abbey on Iona, and he still leads retreats there. Um, and for this chapter, the uh, reconnecting with spiritual practice, he takes us uh, in our mind's eye to a, a circle of stones buried in the turf on the island. And he explains that this legend has it, is where the uh, St. Columba, who is said to have founded the, the island, uh, and his brothers in the monastery there, would come, one at a time, uh, to take time in this circle, which was, was then like a little hut. Uh, that would be their place of retreat, a, a place to come for, to take silence and solitude um, and then they would go back to uh, their life and their work and their duties in the abbey and so in this discipline of retreating they were seeking to find a balance between uh, solitude and relationship silence and uh, expression and stillness and action and we read that this is also how Jesus uh, lived. And we read how he regularly made time to find this balance between outward engagement and inner awareness. And so our first reading is uh, from Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It was very early in the morning and still dark. Jesus got up and left the house. He went to a place where he could be alone. There he prayed. So it's this contemplative orientation to life that John Philip Newell wants to encourage in us and among us. Some years ago, um, a number of us uh, here in St Bride's began meeting together each month to uh, seek to deepen our relationship with each other and with God. And um, at that time, we began exploring the possibility of uh, having some kind of daily practice that we would share that would somehow serve to build um, a common intention amongst us. 
and several of us were inspired by a new book that uh, we had come across at that time uh, entitled Cave Refectory Road, Monastic Rhythms for Contemporary Living, written by Ian Adams. And uh, this notion, with respect to this notion of cave, uh, which is used in a lot of traditions, often it's the cave of the heart, uh, is, is like a, a symbol of, of withdrawal in life. And he writes about this. This is life rooted in stillness, prayer and simplicity. The deep bedrock down to which I will suggest any committed tr spiritual traveller dedicated to following in the way of Christ must go. This is the starting point, the vital story of reconnection with self and with whoever or whatever we may think of as God, the other or mystery. This is the place of self-revelation and the sight of God encounter. Now something else that Ian Adam wrote about in that book was about uh, spiritual formation and um, in fact one of the chapters in that book is entitled Spiritual Formation, Monastic Learning Practices and Becoming More Beautifully Human in the Way of Jesus. Doesn't that sound quite inviting, tantalizing. And at the end of all the chapters, he included practices, simple suggestions of things to do to enhance not only our journeying in the way of Jesus, but also our very humanity. Now, this was all quite a new aspect of Christian faith to me. Um, at that time and it motivated uh, me to begin doing some practicing. Although some years earlier I'd come across the idea of sort of sitting in silence and in fact at one point in my life a few years ago when I was really going through a difficult time I found that really helpful. Um, I really didn't know much about what other spiritual practices there were and what they could offer. Um, I guess the kind of Christianity that I'd previously experienced, of course there was no doubt many of you the same, this injunction to have a quiet time, which actually when you think about it is actually quite wise words, but probably for many of us it was, um, you know, something a bit heavy to, to deal with. Now this is probably because, as our friend Marcus Borg explains, within much of modern Western Christianity, faith came to be understood very much as all about beliefs and propositional truths and orthodoxy and getting, getting it right, rather than, as uh, and Marcus Borg uses the term, beloving God. So, there's a sense in which spiritual practice is how we beloved God and the means by which we live the Christian way of life. This is about direct personal experience, a desire to know God rather than to know about God. This is about intentional disciplines, practices, both individual and collective. Uh, which become the means by which we begin to experience what John Philip Newell describes as the shinings of divine presence that are within us and all around us, which is very much what the Celtic tradition held uh, to be so. So this is what uh, John Philip Newell has to say. Thank you. It is spiritual practice that will again and again enable us to experience the sacred at the heart of life in ways that will shape how we live and undergird how we work to heal the world. Thank you. So what are contemplative practices exactly? 
uh, one definition from a book called Living Deeply says this, any sort of internal or external activities you engage in with the intention of fostering long lasting shifts in the way you experience and relate to yourself and others. And another organization that's done a lot of work in this area called uh, the Contemplative Mind in Society, which has um, a website which you might like to have a look at, um, says this, contemplative practices are practical, radical and transformative. Develop developing capacities for deep concentration and quietening the mind in the midst of the action and distraction that fills everyday life. This state of calm centeredness is an aid to exploration of meaning, purpose and values. Contemplative practices can help us develop greater empathy and communication skills, improve focus and attention, reduce stress, enhance creativity, and support a loving and compassionate approach to life. So some of the most common contemplative practices might include various forms of meditation, mindfulness, time in nature, journaling, uh, chanting even, contemplative arts, and contemplative movements such as Tai Chi, yoga, or Qigong. But there are many others which have their roots in ancient practices from differing traditions across the world. And it seems that in time, at some deep level, practice gives rise to insight, to the possibility of seeing something, some situation uh, in a different way so that changes can be made. And indeed, uh, creativity, intuition, surprise, and phys physicality all become sources of knowing. Now in this chapter, John Philip Newell uh, introduces us to um, someone from uh, within uh, you know, the current time, uh, 20th century, who for him is like a master teacher. So in each chapter, there's um, a person whose life and work he uh, sort of opens up to us. And in this chapter, he in introduces us to uh, someone called Thomas Merton, which I'm sure many of you might have heard of, who uh, was a Trappist monk and a great spiritual master, who had, had a lot to, to write and say about spiritual practice. And uh, John Philip Newell sums up what Thomas Merton says about spiritual practice in three, with three sort of main points. He says, spiritual practice, and this is drawing on Thomas Merton, is about remembering our diamond essence. That which is deepest within us is of God. So spiritual practice connects us to this deepest center so that we come to realize that our identity is not to be found in our social status, our race, religion, all these uh, markers, but is to be found in the very ground of our being. So there's this, this sense of self, there's this, this inwardness, this remembering of what uh, is our ground of being. Because spiritual practice, um, and, and this comes in the next two points, for so long spiritual practice has been critiqued as sort of navel gazing. And there is very much that inward looking, which is an essential part of it. But the next point, the second one, spiritual practice is about remembering the diamond essence in everybody else and in everything else. 
This is an appreciation of the connectedness that is to be found at the heart of all things. A spirituality that is not closed in or cut off from the earth and the struggles of the world, but open to both the glory and the brokenness that are in all things. And then this takes us on again to appreciate that spiritual practice is about accessing the diamond essence of our being in order to be strong for the work of transformation in the world. True strength is to be found in the innermost ground of our being, not in the limited strength of, of ego. So as we experience shifts in perspective, we begin to look at the world with fresh eyes. We begin to see ourselves and our lives differently. And this greater self-awareness somehow enables us to see others differently too. So that we begin to appreciate the essential relatedness we share with others. And it is this that can um, spur us on in, in our work, whatever that kind of work is. Now, at the time when I referred to when like the St. Bride's community group first started some years ago, um, at one point I facilitated that community for um, a few months. And just at that time, um, Rowan Williams, who was then still Archbishop of Canterbury, um, went to Rome and spoke to uh, the Synod of Bishops in Rome. And um, he said some quite interesting things which fit in with, with this. And I remember at the time reading this and thinking, you know, there's something here that I need to, uh, to look at, which has sort of spurred me on, as I say, to, uh, you know, finding out more about practice and, and beginning to try and practice. So here's um, what I think is a really powerful excerpt, just a paragraph from what Rowan Williams um, had to say, and Linda's just going to read it for us. Contemplation is very far from being just one kind of thing that Christians do. It is the key to prayer, liturgy, art and ethics, the key to the essence of a renewed humanity that is capable of seeing the world and other subjects in the world with freedom. Freedom from self-oriented, acquisitive habits and the distorted understanding that comes from them. To put it boldly, contemplation is the only ultimate answer to the unreal and insane world that our financial systems and our advertising culture and our chaotic and unexamined emotions encourage us to inhabit. To learn contemplative practice is to learn what we need so as to live truthfully and honestly and lovingly. It is a deeply revolutionary matter. Thank you. I think you agree those are quite challenging words. <coughs> So spiritual practices are for practicing. You know, we, we listen to, you know, concert pianists and we know that they have spent, I, I don't know, they've done some research, haven't they, that says how many hours, you know, you have to practice to be accomplished at something. So it's practice um, and it's regular practice that reinforces um, the change that we seek. In fact, the science of neuroplasticity suggests that the very ne neurons in the brain uh, can change and new connections can be made. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not practicing for the sake of practicing because spiritual practice um, is, not, is a means, not the end. What we're looking for is, is a life uh, which incorporates all that we uh, learn and become 
in our spiritual practicing. Uh, and it's, of course, easy to, uh, you know, lose the momentum to practice. And uh, I think it's St. Benedict or someone who said, always we begin again. So, you know, if by Wednesday you've uh, dropped, dropped out, then come Monday morning, don't be too hard on yourself. Say, okay, I'll begin again. Um, finding, you know, a teacher or a group that uh, practices some of these practices is obviously um, uh, could be a helpful way forward. As I said, some of them are indiv things that we need to, to attend to individually, and uh, many of them are, are collective practices. You now, even the pra some of the things that we uh, do, you know, here in our services, our, our practices, you know, although we, you know, it just sort of happens, in essence, they they can become the very means by which, you know, we're changed. And I'm sure many of us are changed uh, as, a, light, as a, a result of some of the things that happen in the times that we share here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening. But there are lots of opportunities. You know, our community has a really rich um, group of people who are able to, we are able to learn from. Uh, you know, there are opportunities to learn about mindfulness. There are opportunities to, uh, you know, engage in meditation regular times in the week or silence or movement. Um, so do think about how you might uh, take some of this and uh, incorporate it into your life. <laughs>